Virtual fencing, you know, it's one of those things that for a lot of us as ranchers, we're wondering, can it work and is it cost effective? Everybody that works in the grazing management area sees the potential of what these collars can do. That's Ryan Reuters from Oklahoma State University. He and fellow researchers Laura Goodman and Elena Gerhardt join me as we talk about their project and looking at the viability of virtual fencing for ranchers. We'll talk about the many benefits and the challenges as this technology emerges. And of course, we'll get into the cost-benefit analysis of virtual fencing as we compare it to other forms of controlling animal movement. What we run into with traditional fencing is there's a certain amount of labor, even if you're talking about electric fence, and just putting that fence in that spot. And the labor is much less when you're using technology where you just put the boundary in the program. Set aside the fence stretchers, the pliers, and the steel post driver for just a bit and join us as we talk about virtual fencing on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Hi, everyone. This is the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. We're glad to have you joining us on our program today. Before we get into what's in store for today's show, how are things in your neck of the woods? I know for us here in northeastern Wyoming, we've kind of went through a patch of hot, dry weather here lately, and I'm not going to expand on that too much because I know for the folks down the southern plains, you've kind of had more than your share of hot, dry weather, so I'm not going to bellyache too much here about what we're experiencing here, but I thought it was interesting the other day we were 95 degrees during the day that night it cooled off to 42 degrees so all of that to say fall is in the air if you want to call it that as meteorologist don day will join us later on in our program here today he'll give us an update of what he thinks the weather's going to be looking like for the next seven to ten days out and uh, mentioning that we're kind of getting to that time of the year where maybe a little bit of nip in the air a bit but when it's 95 degrees out and the wind's blowing about 20 miles an hour it's hard to feel like falls in the air for us here that we've been experiencing well for today's show yeah we're going to be talking about virtual fencing in fact i I did a show. It was the 10th episode I did for Working Ranch Radio Show back in 2021, and it was with Chad Boyd out of Burns, Oregon, as we were talking on virtual fencing. Well, a lot of things have changed, and there's been continued development in that segment of the industry and that technology that's out there. And so we're going to be talking today with Ryan Reuters, who is a professor at Oklahoma State University. He's kind of one of the leads on this research project. He, along with Laura Goodman, who's an associate professor, and Elena Gerhardt, who is a PhD student. All of those three are going to be joining us here today to talk about the research that they've been doing at Oklahoma State University on virtual fencing and then also where they're headed to with some of this. We're going to get into a lot of different aspects to some of the things that they think are benefits and where it can be useful on the ranches, some of the issues that they've had to deal with as this technology continues to develop, and just some overall insight that they have as we look at this and their con- and the continual quest by many of these companies companies to see it more widely used in the ranching industry. Is it cost effective to do that? Well, those are some of the questions we're going to be talking about. So be sure to join us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Of course, at the very end of the show, meteorologist Don Day will be stepping in as we take a look at our long-term weather. By the way, did you have an opportunity to listen to last week's show? Well, if you're wanting to know what he believes or thinks that the weather outlook will be for fall, winter, and spring of 2024, Four, then I would encourage you to go to our podcast site at workingranchradio.com or any podcast provider out there. Search for Working Ranch Radio Show. Listen to last week's show and you'll get our conversation that Don and I had on his outlook for the next several months for weather. So a good a program there to kind of get in the feel of what you might be expecting for your neck of the woods. We do break that out by region as well. So it's just not a, a topical overall look of the U.S. or the North America. It, we do break that down by region region. So go back and listen to that if you have an opportunity. Let's thank our sponsors here real quick on the Working Ranch Radio Show today. Vitalix, livestock is your livelihood. Tubs are our expertise. Vitalix, the true blue tub. Find out more at vitalix.com. And the American Gelvy Association, a highly fertile, moderately framed cow that raises high performing calves, even in tough environments. Now that is doing more with less. The Gelvy cow's efficient use of resources make her the picture of sustainability and 
today's modern beef industry. Find out more at gelvey.org. And performance beef. Make decisions based on data, not a hunch. Cattle management software that's easy to use and allows you to simplify feeding, performance, and health data recording from shoot side at the pen or out in the pasture. Find out more at Performance Livestock Analytics.com. And Tank Toad, your remote water monitoring system, all from the convenience of your phone, powered by solar, satellite, and cell. You can keep an eye on your water supply with a daily text message called Metal Arc Solutions today for tank monitors, well controllers, generators, and more. 801 252 6135. It's Tank Toad. Find out more at tanktoad.com. It's what we use here on the X Ring Ranch. Well, it's time now to check in with the captain, Tim O'Byrne, publisher and editor of Working Ranch Magazine, for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. Hey, Justin. Hey, everybody out there in Working Ranch Radio Land. Justin, I pulled this off of Fox News this week. In a motion for summary judgment filed with the Department of Interior's Office of Hearings and Appeals, the state of Montana alleged a Bureau of Land Management rule issued in 2022 unlawfully prioritizes non-production, quote-unquote, conservation herds over livestock production and the state's rural ranching communities. In July 2022, the BLM granted a request to the American Prairie Reserve, APR, to graze bison across leased federal lands. Now, I think, Justin, we talked about this in a couple episodes back. Um, Pretty contentious. I don't believe there was any um, public commentary on that. It was just something I was freight trained through. And I, I want folks to take heed here. Uh, You get backed into a corner, we got to come out pushing. And uh, I think Montana, the state of Montana had a great deal of uh, guts to to, to do this. And Justin, I want to follow up on this as it unfolds and just see how far they get. It might be a really good precedent for us to not get steamrolled by these folks. Back to you. All right. Thanks, Captain. And yeah, you know, folks, here's something else. If you want to go and listen to a little bit of the backstory on this whole issue and the lawsuit coming forward, episode 81 was one we had here. It was just over a year ago where I did an interview with Jay Bodner, who's the executive vice president of the Montana Stock Growers Association, and Caitlin Glover, executive director of the Public Lands Council, as they expressed their real concern and frustration with the process, or maybe I should say lack thereof, the process with the BLM in this whole deal and if you want to go back you'll hear kind of how that started and why there should be some concern not only for folks in montana but if it's happening there today it could be somewhere else tomorrow so it is something that takes a little bit of guts to bring forward appreciate the captain bringing that to our attention here today on the program as well well stay with us coming up next we're going to get into our featured topic it's on virtual fencing stay with us we'll be back on the working ranch radio show after this Animal health is key to your business, so how do you track cattle health treatments? Stop relying on pen and paper or complicated programs. Performance Beef helps you record processing data, enter costs, and track animal health history, all in real time at the shoot. The mobile app also makes it easy to log pasture and pen treatments on the go. Your health data is integrated with feed and financial information in one easy-to-use platform, accessible from your computer, smartphone, or tablet. Find Performance Beef online to request a demo. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills, your host, and we're glad to have you as we continue now and head into our featured interview for today's program. It's a subject we've had once before on our show when we look at some of the technology that is advancing and making its way into our industry. We continue to see these things show up, and uh, one of the things that I have been of interest in is virtual fencing. That's some of the precision agriculture elements that are beginning to we're starting to see more and more in our ranching industry and what is the viability of that down the road for our industry so joining me here today to talk a little bit about it is ryan Reuters, who is a professor at oklahoma state university also laura goodman associate professor there and elena gerhardt who's a ph student there guys thanks for joining us here today on the working ranch radio show you bet justin good to be here yeah thanks ryan i want to start with you you were the one that, to kind of get things sort of started in some of this and looking at the concept of getting some research done on this. 
type of technology that could be a part of the future for the livestock industry. So let's give us a, a little bit of a foundation as we start here today on that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we I've, I've been interested in in virtual fence and, and precision technology for ranching for a long time. And when Laura and I were were hired here at OSU, that was one of the subjects that we talked about that we thought it'd be fun to work together on is is a virtual fence kind of project. At that time, it was it was really a research prototype, and you know there were there weren't really any commercial ventures into developing that that we were aware of but we we had talked about you know what a what an interesting idea it was mm -hmm. and could certainly see what the potential for it would be in in grazing management so yeah when when some of the virtual fence companies started commercializing and and having a, a product that we could beta test we we jumped on working on the project mm -hmm. so yeah Laurel, we'll go to you right now because as Ryan was saying, it was something that both of you had an interest in, you know, mm -hmm. him for the aspect of just the technology and where it can be in our industry down the road. But I know from your specialty, being a rangeland extension specialist and more on that side of things, you were looking at as, boy, this is really an opportunity potentially where we could really manage our grazing a little bit better. Explain that a bit. Yeah. You know, in, in grazing management, we know that we can really change how how plants respond to grazing by rotating animals and, and also, you know, keeping animals out of sensitive areas around streams. And the thing that always happens when we use traditional fencing is that there's winners and losers. So there's 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 plants and animals that benefit from us fencing, but then there's also animals that might there might be a negative impact. And so using something like virtual fence could allow us to have more winners, you know, less physical structures that are going to limit animal use and cause that habitat fragmentation that we sometimes have with traditional fencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bet. So we set it up in terms of where you guys saw this as a value and, and looking at it as a research project. So I guess Ryan or Laura, either one from, from you, let's where did this get started? Because I know as we were talking before we went on air, really the concept of this or your idea of, of getting underway with a research project really started back in 2018. So walk us through that and how that funding kind of came together to make this happen. Yeah, you know, I guess kind of in in general, the, the, the research questions that we ask that get you kind of thinking about it, you know, we've we've used fencing forever to control animal location. That's kind of one of the fundamentals of grazing management. And we've used fence, physical fence forever to do that. And this virtual fence technology is really a mindset shift in thinking about fence and controlling animals on a, on a land basis, putting something on the land to, with the virtual fence, you're really putting something on the animals and managing, you know, the animal directly. And so the, the way that you think about implementing the hardware, the way that you, what you can do, now you're managing animals individually instead of managing landscape and the cost structure of doing that are different. And so though, you know, I think in general, that kind of stimulated a lot of our, of our research questions is if we have this tool to manage animals individually, instead of putting structure on the land, you know, what, what implications does that have for ranchers? What can we do in the environment? What does it cost? How does it work? How do we teach ranchers how to use it? So. Mm -hmm. So really there was an idea coming behind this. I guess I feel as you're looking at this, and I even as I read some of the articles on this is really trying to see where the, if there's going to be a cost benefit on this. I mean, we know Laura, as you were saying, I mean, there's some real advantages in terms of being able to control these animals, where they're mm -hmm. grazing, how they're grazing, and various things like that. Through this project, as you were doing this, was there a part of that where, first of all, it was just a matter of how are animals grazing? Do we? Because I think there was some utilization of some GPS technology and all of this as well. Was that something that was part of this project as well? Yeah. So the collars are GPS enabled, so we we know where animals are grazing. And so initially we were just collecting like, where are they grazing? And then we came up with a grazing plan. And so then, then you can, then you can turn the collars to actually start actively managing them and then see how that's changing their behavior 
and their use across the pasture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in this time frame of that element of studying the behavior, the animal behavior part of it, all in all, was there something as you studied how these cattle were grazing? Was there anything you pulled out of that that maybe was a surprise of any sort? I'll start and then uh, I'm sure Elaine will have some some details. But yeah, I think, you know, a couple of things that, that kind of jumped out of me right at the beginning. And, you know, we don't, I don't have a, whole, a lot of uh, statistical data on, on these things yet, but it surprised me how quickly animals adapted to the collar and, and understanding what the collar was about. You know, we've got, we've got various ways of, of trying to summarize exactly the effectiveness of the collar on a statistical basis. And that kind of, you can get kind of down in the weeds thinking about that, but just in general, you know, the, the collars were more effective than I expected that they would be. Animals learned what they, what the collars were trying to, to have them do pretty quickly. Most of the animals did. And I, I didn't expect that. I probably should have expected that because, you know, we, we've used virtual fence collars with pets for a long time and, and they, most of the, most pets learn pretty quickly what those collars are. So I probably should have expected the cattle would too, but, but I was, I was surprised and, and interested, encouraged to see how well our cattle learned and adapted to the, to the collars, certainly in some of the initial demonstrations that we did. Mm-hmm. Elena, I know you handle a lot of the day to day. And so we'll go to you from your perspective as, as the research project began, because it was kind of phases. It's been going on for several years. There's been different things that you guys have been focusing on. As you started this and the process is like Ryan was saying and the, and the callers were on, anything initially that kind of caught your eye a bit? So it kind of surprised me like how we could upscale it from a small research setting and then take it and apply it to, you know, a lot more cows than what our research ranges are currently running at. So that was kind of cool just to see, to take the technology to a bigger scale and see how that works there. And yeah, at first I was a little skeptical about how well virtual fencing would work, but watching how the animals interact with it, we were able to put a GoPro on a cow earlier this summer and just seeing how quickly certain cows, they they know they don't want to continue to go as soon as they get a sound cue and they'll turn around and they respect that virtual boundary. That was just really, really cool to see because I can see it on the computer and how it works, but then getting to see it out in the real world with the cows interacting with the virtual events, that was just super cool to see the the application of it on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guys, we're talking today about uh, virtual fencing and we've got Ryan Reuters, Laura Goodman and Elena uh, Gerhart with Oklahoma State University joining us. They've been in a multi-year study on virtual fencing using uh, GPS technology on these cattle. When we come back, we still got more to talk about. We're going to talk about the scope and the size of that project and see about more of the findings that they found in this. And I think at the end of the day, really, we're trying to get to, is this a something that's going to be coming down that's going to be very user friendly and ability for us as uh, mainstream ranchers in the country to be using this kind of technology? We're going to get into all that and more when we return here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. A sustainable ranch is one that can do more with less. And for beef producers, it can start right at the herd level with a cow that's efficient with her resources and environment. And in today's modern industry, Gelvie females are the picture of sustainability. Gelvie and Balancer cattle are early maturing with maternal superiority through increased longevity, added fertility, and more pounds of calf wean per cow exposed. Adaptable, versatile, and sustainable. All factors that have a positive impact on your bottom line. Gelvie influenced females, the smart, reliable, and profitable maternal choice for achieving sustainability in today's modern beef industry. Be sustainable, breed Gelvie. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Justin Mills here with you as we continue on with our interview here today. We are talking on virtual fencing and some research that is being done at Oklahoma State University. And we're going to talk about some other places that this uh, similar research is also being done. My guest today that are joining us is Ryan Reuters, who is a professor at Oklahoma State University, Laura Goodman, associate professor, also a range extension specialist, and Elena Gerhardt, who is a PhD student, handles a lot of the day-to-day on this particular research project. 
When we finished up in the last segment, we were talking a little bit about some of the initial elements that they were finding with this particular project and watching some of the cow's behavior and so forth. Elena, I want to go back to you because I think sometimes when uh, those of us that are not in academia and, we, and as ranchers out here and we hear of research projects being done at the colleges, we think, well, you know, it's probably just a little project here on, you know, 10 or 15 hit. It's not that. This is a pretty good sized research project that you guys are doing here at Oklahoma State University. Yeah. So when you kind of were directing the conversation that way, I actually had to go back and look and remember how many <laughs> producers. It seems like we're always adding somebody onto the project. But right now we have five different producers across the state of Oklahoma and southeast Colorado. And the herds range from anywhere from about 25 head to up closer to 100 head of cattle. And then we also have, you know, callers on cattle at different university research stations across the state of Oklahoma as well. So several herds around the Stillwater area and then Oklahoma State University has research farms that we've put callers on. So, yeah, we have a large number of callers on cattle right now. And we're looking at a couple of different things. We are obviously looking at changes in vegetation and water quality and riparian areas specifically. But we also try to take into consideration what works for the producer or what the producer wants to use the technology for. So one producer is really passionate about kind of replacing his cross fencing options. Um, he's going to use virtual fencing for that instead. Um, and then we have another producer who really wants to work to control erosion in his riparian areas. So just taking some of their specific goals and then incorporating that into what we're already doing has been a huge part of of the virtual fencing project. Mm -hmm. Elena, you prompted a lot of different questions, a lot of different things I want to ask about. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to some, of, we'll kind of work through some of those because you, you just, you brought to my mind as you were going through that thing, some different areas I want to go to. We, we started off with talking about the size and the scope of this project at Oklahoma State University. But Ryan, I want to go to you now because it's not just at OSU. There's a lot of different cohorts or other working groups at other colleges across the country that are doing similar studies. I really think what we're seeing here is a lot of a lot of universities are finding it. You know, there's some potential here and really trying to uncover this for producers in their neck of each of their respective neck of the woods. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we we've, we've got uh, five or six hundred callers on cows across different producers, like Elena was saying. But you know. Everybody that works in the grazing management area sees the potential of what these callers can do. And, and we're part of a group that we call the Virtual Fence Working Group. And it's kind of an informal collaboration of about 10 or 12 research institutions, mostly across the Western U.S. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss some, but, you know, some of the, the people that are involved in the working group are like the University of Arizona, University of Nevada, South Dakota State. There's a a research station in Oregon, a USDA research station in Oregon, several other people, Colorado State, several other people that, that we're working with that are that are interested in the same things that we are. And they're they're putting collars on cows in, in even bigger landscapes than we we are. And we're all communicating and working together to try to get to some solutions and some answers and understand how to use this technology better by working together and working cooperatively. So that, that's been a really fun experience to, uh, to kind of have that informal collaboration just kind of grow up from the grassroots. Mm -hmm. You bet. We'll get into some of the things that Elena touched on as far as what some of the producers are using it for. And I think Laura will go to you when we get to some of those kinds of things. But as we look at this, um, I, I want to go through this because I think at the end of the day, we need to know, you know, what you guys are finding as a research on this particular project, what are the hangups? What are the things that, you know, just as anything, there's always pros and cons to everything. And I think the the idea is, is with there's so many universities in this, is it's also helping these particular companies to say, okay, if we're going to make this something that's industry usable down the road, here are the things that we need to work through. So let's touch on some of these things if we can. And let's start with maybe the things that you, you feel like right now, when we think of this particular type of technology, what are some of the things that are maybe the the mountains that we're trying to work on or try to get over on it? Yeah, so there there are a couple of those things. One of the big ones that and it, you know I've I've worked with precision technology in the animal management kind of throughout my research career, and and one of the challenges 
that we always run into with new technology is the engineers and the developers understanding how challenging this environment is. To put a sensor on a cow in a grazing environment, that's a really big challenge. There's a lot of extreme weather, big animals that, you know, that are strong and all of those kind of issues. So, and, and we've gone through a little bit of that, just, just challenges of, of getting the device to be durable and rugged and get us the data that we need so we can evaluate how well the device works. And so, you know, we've, we've gone through that and, and made some, some real improvements there. And, and we think, you know, we've, we've accelerated the, the development process there that we're, we're in a lot better shape in that regard than we used to be. So it's great that, that we've kind of beta tested a little bit and, mm-hmm. and hopefully save some producers from, from having to go through some of that too. So that, that's one issue. Elena could probably tell us a lot of details about that issue she's dealt with. Them. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, another thing that is along the same issue is managing the data that comes from these sensors. And, you know, producers are interested in data, but as researchers, we're very interested in the data. And, and so we, we want to get a lot of data out of these collars so that we can, can do our analyses and, and answer the questions that we have. And so developing a way to get some of the data and developing standardized methods in our, in our research community for how we can analyze it, how we can talk about it, how we can compare OSU data to South Dakota State data and help foster that collaboration by kind of standardizing some of the data analysis. So that, that's been another thing that the, the working group for sure has, has really worked on and focused on. Mm-hmm. I want to get to the cost benefit analysis in our next segment. Before we go to our break, though, Laura, I want to go to you because Elena touched a little bit on this, on what some of these producers are using this for. And a lot of that correlates a little bit with your specialty in terms of the range specialist aspect of that. As, as Elena was talking about, you know, we, we can use it for some cross fencing. Well, we don't need to cross fence unless we're trying to manage our grazing technically, mm-hmm. really. Also erosion control. Let's talk about some of those kinds of things that you feel are really a, a need that you're seeing producers turning towards. So I think the potential for this technology, there's there's so many things that we can do with it. And every time that we, you know, talk to ranchers, they, they're coming up with even more ideas of different ways to, to use the technology. And so one of the goals we have is really looking at how we can keep animals out of, out of streams, especially at specific times of year where where we're getting, you know, lots of rain and we're trying to make sure that we don't have as much animal activity in those areas. So, so that's one, one option. Another thing is, you know, if you know you have potentially toxic plants that grow in your pasture, but they're only in a certain part, you know, then you could just keep animals out of those locations for the portion of the year that that plant is a concern. And so, you know, here in Oklahoma, we get a lot of, a lot of questions about about Johnson grass, but we don't have to worry about Johnson grass all of the year. We only have to worry about it when it's stressed. And so, you know, knowing that you have it in a certain part of your pasture, maybe you just use the virtual fence to keep animals out of there. So the flexibility that the technology provides is fantastic because you might not have to keep animals out of there all the time. And that's the problem with, you know, what we run into with traditional fencing is there's a certain amount of labor, even if you're talking about electric fence and just putting that fence in that spot. And the labor is much less when you're using technology where you just put the boundary in the program. And so, you know, those are those are some ideas. But like I said, the list is kind of endless of how, yeah. how you would want to use that. Yeah, sorry to jump in, Justin. I'm, I'm going to take your job for a minute. Laura, <laughs> will you talk about the wildfire mitigation aspect? Because I, I think that's just such a cool idea and potential use for, for this kind of technology. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, the the main things that we think about with wildfire, of course, is fuels management. And so particularly when we're trying to protect structures and certain sensitive pastures that we might have, just controlling fuels with grazing is a huge option for using virtual fencing. So you can really target grazing within a specific area to decrease those fuel loads. So then when you go into a wildfire season, you're prepared. Um, and you have those areas that you can really defend against wildfire much easier if you don't have that heavy fuel load. So yeah, there's lots of potential for that kind of across the West with increasing fire frequencies. 
Yeah, that's a good point, Ryan. I, yeah, great question too to ask Laura on that because I think for a lot of us, different parts of the country, the wildfire mitigation is is a key thing. You don't even think about. I guess when we, when I first think about virtual fencing, I'm thinking, well, we can control these animals in terms of maybe eliminating some cross fencing and, like you said, keep cattle off of some sensitive areas or some sensitive plants certain times of the year. But uh, you know, the concept of looking at it, well, we can reduce some fuels in some areas that are in certain times of the year that might be helpful in in fire mitigation. So great point there. When we come back, folks, we're going to take a break here. We are talking virtual fencing as we're visiting with folks from Oklahoma State University on a research project that they've been doing now for multiple years, various different aspects that they look at precision agriculture coming into our ranching industry. Well, if you're like me, you're wondering, okay, what's the cost benefit? Can I pencil this? Does it work from from that? And I think we can get into some of that discussion just a little bit here when we return here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. There are lots of nutrition tubs out there, but none can match the true blue commitment of Vitalix. Our tubs offer you the most concentrated nutrition at the lowest cost per day. That means more profit for your operation and improved performance for your cow herd. In fact, research shows Vitalix tubs increase feed efficiency by 20% while boosting conception rates, herd health, and weaning weights. Learn more at Vitalix.com. Vitalix, the true blue tub. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. As we continue with our topic here today, we are looking at virtual fencing and a research project that's been being done at Oklahoma State University for the last several years as they continue to uh, look at ways and how that type of precision agriculture will be implemented or could be implemented into our livestock industry. We're going to talk about here in just a few moments here about some of the cost benefit analysis on that. And, you know, I think for a lot of us as ranchers, like, okay, I see can how it can work. Now tell me the cost. And I'm sure that's a common question you guys all get. Before we get there, though, Ryan, I know that there's you have a lot of partners involved in this that are part of this whole process. So let's talk a bit about that. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, we, we've got, you know, Laura and I have a lot of a lot of people that are working with us on on this project and, and making it happen. And one of the big ones is the Oklahoma Water Center here at OSU in Oklahoma. Kevin Wagner, we, we've been collaborating, the three of us kind of leading this virtual fence effort for, for several years. And so, you know, that's been a really nice tie-in with the Water Center supporting us here in this project. And then some of our grant funding, we, we've kind of talked about some of the research that we're doing and we've definitely got uh, some, some grant funders that are, that are invested and, and supportive of us. We've got a grant from the EPA at the moment and also from NRCS that are, that are investigating different aspects of how we can use virtual fence to achieve some of these goals that we've talked about. So they've been super supportive of and, and excited about what we're doing. Mm-hmm. So, well, let's get into the big, the probably the one question that you have to answer in every one of your producer type meetings, I'm guessing. And that is, as we were saying, I think folks can understand and can see the benefits of a lot of this technology, but then they're wondering, okay, what's it going to cost me? And I know for you guys, you're in the research side of this, is you're not really in the side of selling the technology that's out there. Where are we at with the cost benefit analysis on this, you know, it's it's one thing when it's a fifteen or twenty cow operation. What if it's a two, three, four, five hundred thousand, twenty five hundred cow operation? Is it going to get to that point to where it's viable from a cost analysis basis to be using this type of technology? Yeah, that's a great question. We and, and you're right. We get that in every every discussion. Every time we ask for questions, people always ask, "What's it cost?" You know, and is it is it profitable? And, and probably more people ask what it costs than ask is it profitable, but <laughs> but that is yeah. a that that's a great a great point. And uh, you know, again, it it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about thinking about fencing now instead of putting instead of spending money on a land basis, now we're spending money on a per animal basis because we got to buy a collar and manage for each animal. So. You know, that difference in thinking about the land basis versus the animal basis creates a lot of things to think about from a cost and profitability structure. Additionally, there are several players in the virtual fence business that are companies that are selling virtual fence systems in the U.S. They've they've just kind of 
they they've uh, got into the market recently in in North America, but there are several and they have different structures of how they do things. Some some companies, for instance, sell the collar, and then you pay a per animal per per year fee to access the data and use the system. Other companies just lease the collar to you, so there's just one fee per collar per year. You don't actually buy the collar up front. Some of the technology systems, the way that the collar communicates is each collar would communicate directly with a, a cell phone system, the cell phone tower system. And so you've got costs there associated with, with that data transfer. And then other companies, the collars communicate to a base station. And, and so you don't have that charge uh, for each collar to, to be connected to the cell phone network. But you have to buy the base station and install that and maintain that. So there's there's a lot of different things to think about from a from a cost benefit analysis. One of the things that we're working on right now, especially I've, I've kind of got two avenues working on this. One one is with uh, Dana Hogue's group at Colorado State. They're ag economists, and and we're interested in in doing an analysis, writing a paper on how to think about some of these different aspects of what affects the cost benefit and, and where we see virtual fence being being useful. And then I've also got a, a project recently, again, from the NRCS to, to investigate that a little more deeply and, and build a database of, of different ranch types and kind of build a model of, of where virtual fence would be effective so that potentially they could use that in some of their decision-making going forward and uh, and how NRCS is going to interact with virtual fence. So, you know, there's just a lot of things to think about with thinking about the cost benefit. But in general, I think, you know, there are places today probably that virtual fence makes sense from a, from a money standpoint. There are places today that it does, mm -hmm. and there are ranches today that it doesn't. And so helping producers understand that is going to be where I think we can provide the value to our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Elena, I want to go to you because you do handle as a PhD student there on this project. I do, do know you handle a lot of the day-to-day -day operations of this. So you're the rancher side of it. You're representing the rancher side of this here today because you're the one that has to be out there. You've uh, fidgeted with the deals and you handle the data and you look at the data and those kinds of things. From the rancher's perspective, can we handle this? So like Dr. Reuter said, there are some farms that are ready for that technology and then it's going to work really well on. And then there are other producers that I just, it might not be a good fit for them. So it's a kind of a case by case basis. But I will say each and every producer I've worked with so far on this project has been really excited about learning and using the technology. And one of my producers, he's, he's really excited about the technology and I meet with him on a weekly basis just to learn how to use use the system more effectively or learn a new trick in the programming software that he didn't know, but I might have picked up from working with the company events that we we partner with. So it's just been really fun to teach him new things. I think that there are some limitations to the technology that we are kind of working the kinks out on right now. So as the technology improves, I think that it might be a better fit for more producers across the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, Lane, I'm going to press you a little bit here because I, and I, and, and uh, you're, you're not going to make any enemies here, but I'm going to press you a little bit. I'm going to say, okay, so what makes, what makes somebody, you know, it being a good fit for them and what makes not being a good fit? What, if you could give me a couple of those ideas, what would that be? Well, I think also the different collar systems are one of the first things that people need to look at. The collar is a couple hundred dollars. If you have several thousand animals and you want to spend, you know, a couple hundred bucks on each animal, that might not be the most effective way to go. But if they look at another system with like vents where you don't pay the, the collar, you don't buy the collar, you lease the collar, maybe that's a little bit more of a cost effective way to go. But also producers who might bulk at the, the base station price, they're, they're not going to be ready to spend that money up in front just because it's, it's a lot of money that you have to invest into a technology that, you know, is still being improved upon or they're not familiar with. So people who are technology minded or interested in taking technology to the next level, I think 
are your prime candidates for including virtual fencing on their farm. Mm -hmm. Just a couple minutes left here and uh, Laura, I'll go to you next and then Ryan will finish up with you. Laura, again, in the same vein with the cost benefit type analysis. And I know you also, you know, we're bringing to the table about here's some things that we can really begin to manage with it. From a cost mm-hmm. benefit analysis for ranchers, is it there? Or, and maybe if we're not quite there yet, will we be getting there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, the potential in the future for this technology is that, you know, currently the Natural Resource Conservation Service cost shares prescribed grazing on private lands. And so there's a lot of interest in whether this technology could be part of that cost, those cost share programs. And, you know, I think there's other organizations and stuff that are also helping with, with land management in other ways, like here in Oklahoma, we have Oklahoma Conservation Commission and others that are interested in improving wildlife habitat, NGOs like Quill Forever, Pheasants Forever, those kinds of things. And so there's potential for, for, you know, cost share and guidance on how to use these these different, the technology to accomplish varying goals, depending on what those goals are. So we don't know where it all can go, but I think we're all excited to find out how to use the technology well and where are there areas that need to improve um, and then take that to these different organizations that might be interested in in using it for their different goals. Mm -hmm. Ryan, we'll end with our last question for you. And as you are looking ahead in this particular project, uh, you've got several years already under your belt where you've looked at different things. Where is this project leaning forward as you look ahead? Yeah, you bet. We're, you know, we're, we're thinking now about uh, how we can use some of this precision, start putting some different pieces of precision technology together. You know, this virtual fence system allows us to manage the animal's location uh, but if we can we can tie that together with some of the other precision technology we're working with on how to supplement individual animals at different times of the year, can we get those two pieces to play together and gain some synergies there? Can we incorporate AI into helping us make decisions about where animals should be at certain times of the year? Maybe we incorporate our, our weather forecasting models and tools into some of that as well. And, and just in general, try to keep putting pieces together so that we can make better management decisions. Mm-hmm. You bet. Well, Ryan, I appreciate you joining us here today and setting this interview up. Thanks for doing that. You bet. Thank you, Justin. It's good to visit with you. You bet. And Laura, appreciate your take on this, especially from the side of things that really, I think for a lot of us as ranchers, looking at ways where we see these benefits potentially there. And I appreciate you joining us here as well. Yeah, thank you. And Elena, on behalf of the one out there doing all the work, and I'm just kind of joking a little bit as I'm smiling at everybody else here. I appreciate your work on this. And I think down the road, we're going to see some real benefits of this that I'm kind of excited to see where it's going. So thank you for joining us here today as well. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited too. You bet. And I guess one more question real quick, Ryan, if people want to find out more information about your particular study and, and, and some of the other things that are going on, how do they do that? Yeah, actually, Laura can answer that one okay. better than I can with her uh, social media. You bet. <laughs> Go ahead, Laura. Yeah. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Oklahoma Lands. So we're sharing, you know, stuff that we're doing on the on the virtual fence project there. You bet. All right. Well, guys, again, thanks for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Thank you. Thanks. And again, my guest today, Ryan Reuters, professor there at Oklahoma State University, Laura Goodman, associate professor, and Elena Gerhardt, all joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show, talking about their research project. And I think answering some questions that gives us a feel of where this technology is at, definitely looking at that potential that someday down the road, it could be something that is widely used across the ranching industry. Well, stay with us when we come back. Meteorologist Don Day joins us as we take a look at our long-term weather. We'll be back after this. Do you have a young child, grandchild, niece, or nephew that loves the weather and wants to learn more? Day Weather has produced a children's weather journal full of weather facts, fun weather experiments, coloring pages, and pages to record weather observations for every season of the year. The weather journal is for ages 3 to 7 and designed to be fun and educational. The interactive weather projects are fun for the whole family to take part in. For only $10, the Day Weather Weather Journal is a great gift idea for any occasion. Click on our Amazon link to order at dayweather.com. 
And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills as we head now in and take a look at our long-term weather. And joining us as he does each and every week is meteorologist Don Day. And Don, before we went on air, I was visiting with you a little bit about what do you think is kind of happening here for the next couple of weeks for weather looking out there. And it's just as we head into a new month, even though we went through a blue moon here the last end of last month, once in a blue moon, I think of a country song with those lyrics in it. There's nothing real spectacular looking ahead other than just kind of some fall weather maybe starting to eventually creep in. Yeah, I mean, it, when you get into late August, early September, right, September is really a, a, I call it a bridge month. You know, what you still have summer in it, especially mm-hmm. early in the month, but by the middle to the end of the month, you really start looking at what is 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 really the first little salvos of, of fall uh, beginning to to move into North America. And what we're going to see here in the short term is kind of a little bit of that. It's going to be really, really hot in the Midwest and the Corn Belt parts of the South Central United States uh, as we go into the first uh, week of September. Uh, it's not going to be as intense as the heat that we had earlier in August. But one reason why it's going to get really hot is there's an unseasonably strong cold front that's bringing some needed rain and some cooler weather to the Pacific Northwest. And that's pushing out desert air out ahead of it. And you'll see this sometimes when we have this, these bridge months to where you'll have a big difference in air mass across the United States. You could have this really cool air mass in the far west, really warm conditions in the middle part of the country. And as we go into the, you know, the next 10 days or so, what I see is just exactly what you'd expect. A Mm -hmm. bit of summer in a few areas continuing and a bit of fall as well. Mm -hmm. You know, last week we talked about, we had you on for the entire show and we did a fall, winter, kind of a spring outlook for 2024. It's interesting. I was riding in the car with some people the other day, and the question was: "Was well, are we going to have a early freeze or a late freeze this year?" So, is there any indication what you think it's going to be? Of course, again, this is maybe a question that's really hard to answer because it's very regional. Well, yeah, you know, and, and region specific, and also elevation specific. Mm-hmm. But the the parts of the United States that are are susceptible to getting those early shots of frost or freezing temperatures is certainly going to be the the northern plains and the central and northern Rockies. When you do start to see some of these Canadian cold fronts packing a little bit more of a punch. And we do see that. We do see that compared to, let's say, the last two fall seasons where the the first frost or freeze for a lot of folks came pretty late. Mm -hmm. This was especially true in 2022, last, last fall. I do think fall will be off to an early start. And and so what we're talking about when we're looking at the calendar right now, really, I would not be surprised in the next two or three weeks, uh, parts of North America, whether it's central and western Canada or the north central and some north central parts of the United States may be dancing with that 32 degrees one morning. Hmm. When we started the show, I talked a little bit about the weather a bit because one day we were 95 degrees with the wind blowing, and then that night we cooled down to 42 degrees. So you definitely, to me, that really is an indication that we're approaching that time of the year where those temperature swings can really happen in the course of one day. That's right, and that's why you always have to be really aware of things. And and when you get into early fall, when you have a big warm-up, doesn't matter where you are. If you had a big warm-up, that means somebody else is getting a big cool down and eventually that eventually that's going to get to you. So we do tend to see these. It's like what happens in spring. You know, you can have a really spring like pattern and go right back to winter again. Fall is a similar situation, except everything's just reversed. You you have some bouts of heat still, but you always are going to be watching and keeping uh, keeping an eye over your shoulder, and keeping an eye on what's what, what's happening up in Canada, what's mm-hmm. going on in Alaska and seeing if there's an opportunity for some of that weather to head south. And I do think by the, the third to fourth week of September and, you know, that first week of October, we need to keep an eye on. Okay. All right. Well, Don, appreciate you joining us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Thanks for having me. And again, that is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather here today. You can find more information on his daily video podcast by going to his website at dayweather.com. Or you can also find him on YouTube as well. It's a good way to get each and every day started with a look of what's going to be uh, shaping up for the weather across the country. Well, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about what's in store for next week's edition of the Working Ranch Radio Show. We'll be back after this. 
aid stressed cattle during weaning, shipping, receiving, and vaccination by delivering a multi-day supply of essential minerals and nutrients. With Zinpro Profusion Drench, you can keep receiving calves performing and achieve a 16 to 1 return on investment with 20% reduced respiratory loss. Optimize performance from the start with Zinpro Profusion Drench. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. How many of you have had your opportunity to yet or at least get started through your latest issue of Working Ranch Magazine? Yeah, the September-October issue is out. In fact, I'm looking at mine here in my hot little hands. And uh, always, as they do each and every issue, jam-packed full of stories, articles, information that are very useful to those of us here in the ranching industry. In fact, I was visiting with a guy the other day. He had gotten the latest issue of Working Ranch Magazine, and it prompted him to give me a call about a question he had and in that uh, he was just pretty amazed at how uh, how useful how much information was in the magazine and I wasn't real surprised I've been around it for many many years and and know that each and every issue continues to come out with things that are very applicable not only with our industry but more specifically the time of year in fact in this one the latest issue you'll see the care cattle care catalog in that as well but one part that I always turn to one of the first things I always go to is that that's an improvement. That's one of the things I like to see is, you know, what were uh, maybe some inventions or maybe some things that are, have changed with different types of uh, things that we use here in the ag industry. Well, this one is no different. And ironically for us, it kind of hits me at a point in time where we were looking or have been looking at portable corral systems. Uh, my brother and I have some cattle set up in a uh, forest permit up at the home place uh, where I grew up at and they're back in the in the hills there and in about 10 to 15 days we need to pull bulls and precondition calves well we're really not wanting to push them about two three miles down out of the hills into the corrals because they're kind of hard to get back out of there if they don't want to go back and so we're looking at ways we can get some portable corrals up in there and lease a set or so well in the latest issue of working ranch magazine in the that's improvement section that starts on page 20 well they go through all of the different types of portable corral systems that are out there. There's a lot of different manufacturers that are building them from rawhide portable corrals to the express portable corral, Lynn Post Wrangler corrals, and the MJE livestock equipment. So a good review on those, give you an idea if it's something you might be looking at. I know for a lot of us, we could always use more corrals and the convenience of being able to pack them up and move them around and get them spread out and get to going again is pretty handy. By the way, if you do not have your subscription yet, start to Working Ranch Magazine, or you want to renew it, you can go to their website at workingranchmag.com. Well, be sure to tune in next week. We're going to be talking mineral program and further out, working again with Steve Cody. He joined us a little over a month ago as we did a, a program on low stress stockmanship. We're going to focus on weaning and fall work with Steve Cody in our next one, working on that. So be sure to tune in in our upcoming shows of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Well, before we head out, a quick tip of the hat to our sponsors today Vitalix the true blue tub find out more at vitalix.com and the American Gelvy Association you can find out more there at gelvy.org performance beef cattle management software that's easy to use their website is performance livestock analytics.com and tank toad your remote water monitoring system from the convenience of your phone tank toad.com is where you can find out more information the working ranch radio show is a production of working ranch management magazine branded number one by America's Ranchers. Now, if you'd like to get a hold of me, my email address is justin.workingranch at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. Let us know. Be sure to tune in next week at this same time, same place, or on your favorite podcast provider. I'm your host, Justin Mills, and until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long. So long.